what do you think you see in front of you? I see molecules. The way we represent molecules graphically is an important topic to review in your organic chemistry knowledge as you prepare for biochemistry. We're going to be showing molecules, we're going to be talking about molecules, their reactivity, their structures. These are important topics that we need to be able to express with simple diagrams. Now, this complicated structure is actually hundreds or maybe thousands of molecules called phospholipids, and this is a small section of the famous lipid membrane. There is one layer, there is the other layer, here's the polar head groups at the top, this is the uh, vegetable oil-like core of the lipid bilayer, and there's the water-friendly uh, other surface. And this is an important structure in biochemistry. And look at all those molecules. How can we possibly represent that so that we can easily understand it? Well, let's explore a quick review of the structure of organic molecules and how to communicate them from me to you and you to me in or uh, organic chemistry and biochemistry. I'd just like to make a quick plug for my website, keynotechemistry.com. Um, I built this website to support these lectures so that the slides would be available to the general public uh, as well as my students. So if two years from now you're a former student of mine and you want to check out my slides for a quick review, they'll be available at keynotechemistry.com even if you can't access them through the course management site. And if you're a member of the public, welcome and please enjoy this lecture. So. Communicating chemistry. Well, imagine you were trying to get across a simple idea. These are some sketches by Pablo, pa uh, Pablo Picasso, and look. Does that look like a dog to you? Of course it does. What's this? And what's this? You get the idea really quickly from those very simple diagrams, what structures they represent. And that's what we want to do with organic chemistry structures. We want to come up with a simple structure that expresses kind of in a quick glance what that molecule is. You can see ethanol here. You can see acetic acid. These graphical uh, constructions represent the structure of these molecules. This ethanol is different than this um, acetaldehyde. They have different properties, different boiling points, different chemistry. So this diagram is actually important that you can tell exactly what's going on compared to ethanol because this would kill you and this will kill you a lot more slowly. Now, 100 years ago, um, organic chemists thought this was a very important topic, how to represent structure. This is Hoffman, very famous German chemist. He was headhunted um, by Oxford and joined uh, the chemical industry or the chemical education industry in the United Kingdom. Uh, and that, that was a big accomplishment because it, met, it began the process by which uh, British organic chemistry actually started. Until that point, everyone had to go to Germany to learn organic chemistry. Now you could learn it from Hoffman right there in London. Um, this was his idea of organic structure. This is methane. This structure that he put for this model was actually perfectly flat. He just had a carbon and four sticks coming out of it and a cross for the hydrogen atoms. This is ethylene. Now, double bonds weren't understood. They knew that there was two carbons and four hydrogens in ethylene, and this was his attempt to explain the structure. Today, we would draw it like this. So this simple diagram expresses the chemistry, the structure, and the reactivity of ethylene, whereas this more ancient structure does not. So the conventions that we use to express the structure of organic molecules are important for understanding reactivity as well as the 3D shape. Now, it's important to recognize that these diagrams are just diagrams. Molecules are dynamic, moving structures, bonds are rotating, things are happening, but it's amazing how these simple structures tell us so much once we understand the conventions. This is glyceraldehyde, the simplest sugar. Um, and we can see it's got two alcohol groups and an aldehyde group. This diagram immediately lets us identify the aldehyde and the alcohol group. So th these conventions let us understand the uh, uh, structure and reactivity. This is a more 3D graphical arrangement. This is kind of a ball and stick model. You can make these with computers. Uh, I could draw this with a pen and pencil. Uh, my artistic abilities do not let me draw this, but a computer can create it. Um, it gives you pretty accurate 3D sort of view of the molecule, but we can, we can copy this by using graphical conventions in this molecule to give you the exact 3D arrangement, because there's two possible ways to arrange four different things. 
around that carbon. And there's another way that we'll see biochemists use to explain molecules, and that is this uh, space filling model. And now this model gives you the electronic volume that uh, the molecule behaves as if it has. Like if you looked at this molecule, if you shrunk like Ant-Man, and we're looking at that molecule, you wouldn't see anything because the nuclei and the electrons at this scale are far too small to see. But you would see how it behaves. The electrical field of the electrons will bounce off another molecule at an average of this distance here. So these spheres are the average distance at which the various molecules bounce off each other from, from each nucleus. So they're kind of the space the molecule takes, the space filling model. Now, this is often called a CPK model after Corey, Pauling, and Colton. Uh, Linus Pauling, very famous chemist, and Corey, they built a series of wooden molecules on a scale of one inch to one angstrom. Uh, they went to the Caltech wood shop and said, could you make us all these wood balls? And they used those wooden balls, which they had milled with, with faces that mimic the exact bond angles that they understood uh, at the time. And they used those models to create the first models of the famous alpha helix and beta sheets in proteins. And years later, Walter Colton uh, invented a plastic connector for uh, these models, and they became CPK, K for Colton, uh, CP for the models, K for the better connectors, um, and these models were a mainstay in organic chemistry well into the 90s, I'd say, and then suddenly computer graphics replaced them all. We don't need stunt people anymore. We can do it all with computers, and the same thing happens in chemistry. Now, diagrams and pictures will tell us a little bit about structure, but those diagrams also tell us about the reactivity, and we need to be able to interpret the electronic structure of a molecule from the diagram. And a lot of the diagrams we draw, you could actually say, are versions of Lewis structure. There's Gilbert Lewis, who came up with the idea that um, oxygen, carbon, all those first row elements, or second row elements, have eight electrons around them, and that they arranged in pairs, and that a pair between two atoms is a bond, a pair, they can have a lone pair, and he came up with this. This is the Lewis dot structure for acid aldehyde. But what does that really tell you? That's a lot of electrons. It tells you exactly where they are. It tells you where the double bonds are, but it is a little complicated to interpret or a little clumsy. Here's a more typical Lewis structure where we use single lines to represent the atom pairs that make bonds, and we show you explicitly the double bonds. Now, this is also a Lewis structure. Uh, but made with single lines. And uh, uh, a lot of people would call this a Kekulé structure because uh, we're uh, uh, using lines to represent the connections and we're not explicitly showing the carbons. Um, this is a simpler graphic structure of this, but it has the same information because we know this oxygen has two lone pairs. We know this oxygen has two lone pairs. So never forget where the lone pairs are. They're going to be really important in a molecule. And we can get even simpler. Notice I dropped the hydrogens here, but we know that carbon there has two hydrogens attached to it in addition to the atom shown because we know every carbon needs four things around it. Now, we can also express the three-dimensional structure of acid aldehyde by using this dash, dashed line and wedge type structure. You know, that's coming out at you, that's going back in. And if we use the simplified Kekulé structure here, we can also say that's coming out at you, the hydrogen's missing. Well, you know what? If these two lines are in the paper and this is coming out at you, we know where that hydrogen is. It's going back into the paper there. So being able to quickly interpret these simplified diagrams is going to be important. You need to practice recognizing where the hydrogens are and how many, and of course, the lone pairs. Those are important in the reactivity. And soon I'm going to be telling you about another way to express the three-dimensional structure around any particular carbon, the famous Fischer projection. This cross here gives you the same information as this diagram here. And it's even simpler to draw. And in biochemistry, we tend to do our chiral uh, structures and sugars especially using Fischer projection because it's just very simple uh, for a structure that's got a lot of uh, chiral carbons. So why do we keep things so simple? Why am I uh, not showing you the lone pairs, not showing you the hydrogens in this simple structure? Well, I invite you to consider, let's go back to August Kekulé here and his famous Kekulé structure, notice to use lines to express the structure of benzene. So he's sort of a father of um, uh, molecular representation. And he was, of course, the person who famously proposed the structure of benzene, uh, unless you want to give the uh, credit to Schmidt. And this is not a Kekulé structure. We've got the lines, but we're showing the lone pairs. We're showing everything. And 
this is a, a complete Lewis structure. And uh, I don't know, can you tell that that's coenzyme A? Would you prefer it like this? Which diagram is easier to interpret? So this is how I will be presenting a lot of structures in biochemistry in this simplified Kekulé structure, just single line showing the bonds. I'm ignoring hydrogens, we know they're there. The only places I explicitly show hydrogens are atoms where you might have no hydrogen or one or two on nitrogen, depending on its charge. Like you're never gonna pull a carbon or a hydrogen off of this carbon. Um, so where there's acid-base groups, I'll definitely show hydrogens. Where there's carbons, I won't, I won't show lone pairs, but we know they're there. I know there's a lone pair off of this nitrogen right here. Um, and so that's just easier to interpret. I can quickly go, there's the thiol. That's the nucleophilic end of coenzyme A. I can quickly spot the nucleotide group of the adenine. Um, I can spot the phosphate um, diphosphate bridge between the pantothenic acid and the nucleotide. So uh, all of these things can be easily interpreted um, if we avoid this complicated idea here. All of the information that's stored in this structure here is present here if you know that an oxygen has two lone pairs, this nitrogen has one lone pair, that kind of thing. All right, so review your electronic structure, review organic structure as you prepare for biochemistry. Now, I wanna just quickly uh, take a moment and look ahead. We'll be talking about stereochemistry soon. And stereochemistry, as we know it, was started by Van Hoff, who was attempting to explain uh, a lot of the observations that were coming out of the late 1800s about carbon. And he famously proposed that carbon had to be tetrahedral. And look, right there in Acid, or sorry, in uh, glyceraldehyde, we see the tetrahedral carbon. There's four things around it, and you're coming out the four corners of a tetrahedron. And his tetrahedral carbon is really the, the progenitor of Vesper theory. Uh, Vesper theory, as it proposed by Nylon, Sidgwick, and Gillespie, um, is, uh, explains tetrahedral carbon, planar carbon, linear carbon, sp3, sp2, sp. Those are all things you need to review about the structure of carbons, because carbon is a very important element in organic and biochemistry. So here's one tetrahedral arrangement around the center carbon of glyceraldehyde. Here's the other possible tetrahedral arrangement around the center carbon of glyceraldehyde. And those are two different arrangements. Those are actually two different molecules, and we have consequences for that. And we'll talk about that in a few uh, slides. So. Here's all kinds of ways to represent uh, a sugar. This, is, this could be glucose. This is certainly a hexose. It's an aldose. It's got an aldehyde at the number one carbon. It's got four carbons that have hydroxy groups on them. So there's four alcohol groups here and a fifth alcohol group down here. These four are chiral. There's four different things around each of these. And if the glucose, if we have glucose, then we have four specific chiral arrangements. And so there's one way to draw it, and we could draw it with Fisher projection this way. I can give you the cyclic structure where this alcohol adds to that aldehyde to make this six-membered ring. And you can see in the chair conformation here, like there's an OH, that's this alcohol group. The hydrogen, of course, is sticking up axial. That's equatorial, equatorial, axial. So you want to review six-membered rings and the nomenclature of axial and equatorial groups. Equatorial sticks out to the outside, axial in the... Chair, uh, chair form here is sticking straight up. I could also just draw it as a six-membered ring and just give you the uh, dashes and wedges, which were popularized by Donald Cram. He didn't invent this way of, of graphically representing molecules with dashes and wedges, but he wrote a textbook that became very famous and included them in it, and basically uh, everyone started using them after his textbook. Now, these sort of very flat structures that don't include dashes and wedges, they're called projections. A projection is a two-dimensional version of a three-dimensional structure. Here is a projection of your hands. And notice I, that shadow is a two-dimensional representation of this three-dimensional hand structure. Well, there's a, a two-dimensional diagram that gives you all the three-dimensional information contained in this uh, cram type structure. And that's because we know the code of Fisher projection, which I will be talking about shortly. Now, sometimes in biochemistry, you will see molecules presented like this. But that doesn't really tell us a lot about the reactivity of this molecule. I mean, that, that diagram is very useful. It gives us a, the volume of a phospholipid, but it doesn't tell us, did you notice? Did you notice the double bond? 
Were you able to spot that? There it is, right there. But that didn't jump right out at you, but it jumps right out at you here. You see that double bond, you know this is an unsaturated fatty acid. So I'm going to mostly present molecules when I present them on their own uh, with these simple diagrams. But when I'm talking about how they interact with other molecules, I might use di uh, pictures like this because it gives you the better idea of the volume and stuff. Right away on this, I can see the chemical groups. I can see this quaternary nitrogen, which is going to be positively charged. I can see this phosphate diester. I can see these ester groups. I can see this alkene group. All of them are easy to spot. And all of them uh, tell you how they were made. We know that esters can be made by condensing an alcohol from this glycer uh, glycerol with this carboxylic acid from this unsaturated fatty acid. Uh, any condensation of an alcohol and an acid is an ester. So phosphoric acid, when it's condensed with an alcohol, will make a phosphate ester. And we do that twice here. We have a phosphate diester. This choline molecule has an alcohol and the amine in it. I can see all the functional groups that gave rise in the end to the connections of the phospholipid. So it's important to understand the chemistry of the formation of esters, of uh, uh, substitution reactions, which uh, could create these nitrogens, put insert nitrogens in the molecules. All of the chemistry of organic chemistry you will see again in biochemistry. So um, I have a separate presentation on functional groups and reactions of functional groups. So please do take a moment to go through that and also to review your organic chemistry. Uh, you don't have to memorize it all now, but as we go through the course, whenever you come across something that's got some organic chemistry in it, crack open your notes from last year and make sure you understand what's going on. Now here's some ways to represent molecules. Uh, this is ethylene with its double bond. There's a, uh, a fatty acid, capric acid, with its uh, carboxylic acid. Those are all important uh, uh, ways to express molecules. Um, the lines give you an idea of the electronic structure, which tells you the reactivity. For example, this is fructose, but that could be any sugar. That could be any six carbon sugar. C6H12O6, that could be glucose. How do we know that's fructose? Well, maybe we should give you the line connections for the bonds. Is that fructose? Well, we now know it's a ketose. We know that it is not uh, glucose because glucose would have the aldehyde, the double bond here with an aldehyde rather than here with a ketone. But that could be any uh, version of fructose. It could be psychose, tagatose, or sobose because there are four combinations of the, chiral of the three chiral centers here. But it is in fact fructose if I show you this version. So there it's got a D arrangement on its highest numbered chiral carbon and the relative stereochemistry of the remaining two groups reveals that it is in fact fructose. If I had sorbose, it would taste different. It would have a different melting point. It's a different molecule. Um, so being able to accurately represent the structure of fructose is important. Now, whenever someone shows you a molecule, there's lots of ways to do it. Um, I've shown you this CPK version. I could do it as a ball and stick. This is the amino acid methionine. I could give you a simpler version of the ball and stick, uh, which is called a stick structure, um, where you uh, just show you the connections between the, the points that make up the atoms. I could give you this stick structure without the hydrogens. If I was showing you a complicated protein structure with all the amino acid side chains, I would probably eliminate the hydrogens just to keep it less busy. I could certainly show it to you as a chemical diagram. And once you see a chemical diagram, the reactivity becomes much more apparent. What does red mean to you? But oxygen means something to me. It means that there's two lone pairs here. I see a carboxylic acid that's an acidic group, that's a basic group. Um, a lot of information is given to me by this diagram. Um, this is a, uh, uh, here's the chiral center shown to you in Fisher projection. If there's a C here, it means that we're not intending to imply any stereochemistry. But if you make a cross without the C, uh, most people would assume that that is Fisher projection. Fisher projection, the cross, without the C, I am telling you the stereochemistry, that this is in fact an L amino acid. And I could of course do the Kekulé cram type uh, representation there as well. So know how to represent a molecule, know how to express uh, the 3D structure, because stereochemistry is important. This is a hand. Is that a right hand or a left hand? You can tell immediately, you knew immediately that that was a right hand. 
Why? Because you know the rules. Well, there's the same rules in designating stereochemistry and molecules, because in biochemistry, right and left matter. Almost everything is chiral in biochemistry, almost everything is right-handed or left-handed, and only one of these hands will fit a single glove. If I held up a glove, it's going to fit on one hand or the other. The right-handed glove will go on the right hand. Chirality matters. Here's a place where chirality matters. Keys. These are two keys. They're mirror images of each other. One is the mirror image of the other. Only one of them will fit in this lock. You take a good close look at those two keys on the handout here and tell me which key fits in that lock. Only one will. And as you figure that out, you will understand the nature of chirality. L-glyceraldehyde will not fit in the active site of an enzyme that reacts only with D-glyceraldehyde or vice versa. Um, so if you have a very specific shape, only one of the mirror images of a chiral molecule will fit in this chiral slot. The first person to sort of make a direct observation of this in organic chemistry was Louis Pasteur. He was working with tartaric acid. He was working with the French wine industry. He, uh, he invented the field of microbiology because he started, he recognized that there were two microorganisms that might be in wine. He was able to identify the yeast which you wanted, the bacteria which you didn't. He came up with a way to kill the bacteria, pasteurization, so that you didn't have bacteria that would sour your wine. He saved the French wine industry. They were having a lot of problems with wine going bad. He figured out how to stop that. But along the way, of course, you get involved, you think about wine chemistry, you notice that there's these crystals that can come out of wine. And that's a lot of that is tartaric acid. And uh, tartaric acid uh, was a fascinating molecule because when it was made by nature, if you isolated tartaric acid from wine, it optically rotated light. The solution would rotate plain polarized light. This had been observed in crystals, um, and it was observed in organic molecules. And it was pretty much assumed that this was something uh, unique to living things. Molecules made by organic molecules were magic. They could rotate light. Or no, oh, sorry, molecules made by organic living things were magic. They could rotate light. Molecules made by industry, and you could make tartaric acid in an industrial process, it didn't rotate light. So why was this? Why, why was it something that's made industrially didn't rotate light and something that was came out of a living system made by the yeast uh, in the wine um, uh, bottle. Why, why is that rotate light? Well, what he did was he took industrially produced tartaric acid and he crystallized it. And he was very lucky he happened to crystallize it. it happened to be that the temperature of the day he crystallized it at was just the perfect temperature for the crystals to, uh, for the molecules to separate into two separate crystal forms. This was one um, uh, enantiomer of tartaric acid. This was the other enantiomer of tartaric acid. And they form crystals that you could see the mirror image nature of them in the crystals. And with a microscope, he was famously able to separate them. And then he took all the right-handed crystals, if you will, he put them in water, same with the left-handed crystals, and he saw that they rotated light. One rotated light exactly the way that uh, natural tartaric acid did. The other rotated light exactly that way, but the opposite direction. And now he understood why industrially produced tartaric acid didn't rotate light. It had both enantiomers there, whereas living things only produce one enantiomer of tartaric acid. This was a breakthrough discovery. Jean-Baptiste Biot, the discoverer of optical rotation and organic molecules, was, was so excited. He ran to Pasteur's laboratory. He demanded a demonstration of the experiment. Uh, and he became Pasteur's um, mentor and uh, his uh, gateway to higher levels of scientific achievement um, and society. And uh, so here's the two enantiomers of tartaric acid. One rotates light to the right, it's dextrorotatory. One rotates light to the left, it's levorotatory. So star stereochemistry started with biochemistry. It was first observed in living well, molecules made by living things. Actually, organic chemistry, the field of organic chemistry, started out studying molecules made by organic or living things versus inorganic chemistry, which was molecules that didn't need that. Um, and, uh, and biochemistry just sort of continued to grow and became its own field eventually. Now, stereochemistry matters. Um, these gloves are chiral. These gloves are not. These gloves, these flat gloves, you can put on either hand. These gloves that have 3D asymmetry, they, one fits the right hand, one fits the left hand. So chirality matters, and it's going to matter in molecules. Here I have glycerol. 
all right? And you look at it, look at the mirror images. I can take this glycerol and I can spin it around and drop it on top of this one and I have exactly the same molecule. Why? Because there's symmetry here. This carbon here has two of the same things coming out the left and the right. It's symmetrical, so it is not chiral. But if I take the symmetry away, here's glyceraldehyde. It's got four different things. Suddenly there's one way and the other way to arrange things in three dimensions. And that matters because they're mirror images, right? There's one way and the other way. We all know about identical twins, right? How do we tell them apart? We need a way to designate them. Now it's easy, we know. All identical twins are good or evil, right? So if you needed to identify an identical twin, you could call one the good twin, one the evil twin. Well, organic molecules are the same way. We need a way to identify them. We do it through optical rotation. One will rotate light one way. The other enantiomer will rotate light the opposite way. So starting with glyceraldehyde and Fischer, uh, the famous uh, chemist who, who did so much to understand the stereochemistry of sugars, he did it this way. He started with the simplest sugar, glyceraldehyde, and he said, one rotates right to light to the left, one rotates light to the right. He didn't know what the structure was. He didn't know that this was the exact structure of L-glyceraldehyde. He just knew that there was one way and the other way. His Fischer projection was just an expression of that. All he did was he just drew a cross and he said, this means one way. If I put the OH on this side, that's one way. If I put the OH on the other side, it's the opposite way. So he could now express relative stereochemistry, same or opposite, by which side of the cross he put the OH on. And that's L-glyceraldehyde, that's D-glyceraldehyde. And he just said, you know what? Whatever is the same configuration as D-glyceraldehyde shall be D. That's, that was uh, the origin of this whole LD stereochemistry. Fisher said that. He was such an important chemist, won one of the very first Nobel Prizes in organic chemistry. Um, so this is D-glyceraldehyde right here. This is L-glyceraldehyde. Notice the capital L. Notice the capital D. We are now leaving behind the fact that it rotates light left or right. What we are saying is it's the same configuration as glyceraldehyde that rotates light to the right. D-glyceraldehyde is the same configuration as glyceraldehyde that rotates light to the right. This plus means it rotates light to the right. Why do we often see that plus when we're talking about L and D? I mean, shouldn't it be like L or D? It's a fact, right? Um, but here's L-serine. It is the opposite configuration of D-glyceraldehyde, or the same configuration as L-glyceraldehyde, if you want to think of that. Um, but it rotates light to the right. So the direction that light is rotated is, is a physics thing. It has to do with a lot more uh, than just the exact 3D shape, electronics, all that kind of stuff. But if we know that it's the opposite of D-glyceraldehyde, we know what it is. We don't know exactly the 3D arrangement. All we know is it's the opposite of D-glyceraldehyde. So until the 1950s, no one knew the exact 3D arrangement of atoms in space. All you knew was they were the same as D-glyceraldehyde, or they were the opposite of D-glyceraldehyde, and we just had to call them D or L. So, we now understand that enantiomers are different as far as other asymmetric systems go. And you can have two enantiomers, well not two enantiomers, you can have two chiral centers in the same molecule, which means now there's a number of possibilities. Tartaric acid, the famous tartaric acid that Pasteur used, has two chiral centers. And this is the D enantiomer, because the highest numbered carbon here rotates, well, is, is on the same configuration as D-glyceraldehyde, and here the carbon is in the same configuration as L-glyceraldehyde. So this is the L, this is the L-glyceraldehyde, or sorry, the L-tartaric acid, and this is the D-tartaric acid. On their own, they have exactly the same chemical properties. If I have pure D-tartaric acid, it's got the same melting point as pure L-tartaric acid. Now, the chiral centers are opposite configuration. You can see in the Fischer projection, same configuration as D-glyceraldehyde, opposite configuration of D-glyceraldehyde. Um, but in this tartaric acid, mesotartaric acid, it's actually a different molecule because here they have the same chiral configuration. And the mirror image of this would actually be the same molecule. This molecule has symmetry. And why does it have symmetry? Because I can draw this dotted line across the molecule and I can reflect the top half to the bottom half. 
This is a symmetrical molecule. It doesn't rotate light. It is not chiral. Even though it has two chiral centers, this molecule has symmetry, and as a result, it doesn't rotate light. It has its own internal symmetry. So that means there's two different, if you will, kinds of tartaric acid. There's the uh, uh, D and L tartaric acid, and they're exactly the same. They're just enantiomers of each other. They'd only differ if they encountered another asymmetric system. And this, which is internally different than these two enantiomers. Um, so if you've got two chiral centers, there's four possibilities. Two of them gave you D and L tartaric acid. The other two were the two enantiomers of mesotartaric acid who happen to be identical because of the symmetry. So when you've got a couple of chiral centers, you can have two chiral centers or diastereomers. And a diastereomer is when you've got more than one chiral center. And as a result of the 3D arrangement of those centers, they're not mirror images of each other. If they're not mirror images of each other, they're diastereomer. If they are mirror images, they're enantiomers. Enantiomers, same properties, same melting point, same, uh, same uh, in general, the same chemical properties. But if they're diastereomers, they're different molecules. Let's explore this possibility here. So here's the sort of other ways you might draw uh, tartaric acid. And here you can see the D and L, and you can see that these two are mirror images of each other. If you draw them a different way, they're still mirror images of each other. But the meso, its mirror image is the same molecule. Like the mirror image of this, you could just flip it over and get that same molecule back. You can't do that with the L tartaric acid. Now, Fisher used Fisher projection to characterize each of these centers. And uh, so here's the D-glyceraldehyde, and there's D-glyceraldehyde arranged in Fisher projection. So you could have it with the dash and wedge, which looks a bit like this, you know, from the side, or you could have it with the Fisher projection, which looks as if you had arranged it to kind of look at it from the top. Uh, but they're all the same molecule. Every picture here is the same molecule. All these ones that use the cram dashes and wedges, and this one, which is pure Fisher projection. They're giving you exactly the same information. Now, Fisher didn't know the exact 3D structure of these molecules. I'll show you on the next slide how we know what that is now. But in the 1950s, through X-ray crystallography, it was figured out exactly what the 3D structure of one molecule was. And we knew that molecule was a D molecule, which meant if that every single D and L molecule could be immediately declared to be one 3D arrangement or the other, because it's the same as or opposite as that center, right? And uh, so Fisher projection was now able to be translated directly to the truth. All Fisher knew was it was the same as natural glyceraldehyde or the opposite of natural glyceraldehyde, which is deglyceraldehyde. Um, his Fisher projections were not intended to imply a 3D structure. They were just intended to imply same as or opposite. But now that we knew what it was, we retconned the Fisher projection to uh, now tell you that it actually means some 3D structure. Uh, so you can take like a 3D structure, you can project it down into two dimensions, but if you say, you know what, we're always going to arrange it a certain way. We're always going to arrange it so that the vertical ones, the W and X here, are going back into the paper. The horizontal ones, the X and the Z here, are coming out of the paper. That you're going to say, uh, we're going to say long after Fisher was dead, we decided that his projections meant they were like a hug. Your arms are coming out toward the person you're going to hug. Your body is up and down, your arms are side to side, the side to side ones are coming out like a hug. Fisher projection only applies to the one carbon where the cross is. Don't try to imagine the whole molecule arching back into the page, just every single cross. The two on the left and right are coming out at you, the vertical are going back. And then you can start moving it around in your head and so you can draw the, uh, the dashes and wedges projection. So that's all Fisher projection means in real 3D. We have, now that we know the structure of D-tartaric acid, which was determined by X-ray crystallography by Johann Bivoit, once he figured this out, suddenly we knew the true 3D structure of D-glyceraldehyde. Because if we knew this was D, and now we know its 3D structure, then we know the 3D structure of every D, and every L, because it's the opposite. But now that we know the absolute configuration of these molecules, we need a way to describe absolute configuration. No longer satisfied to just call everything same as deglyceraldehyde or opposite to deglyceraldehyde. We need something that has its own internal rules. It's independent of relative to anything. It is absolute 
absolute configuration. And I give you Con, Ingold, and Prelog, the Con, Ingold, Prelog model, R and S. And uh, they proposed the uh, R and S scheme at a stereochemistry conference in the 1960s. They wrote out the rules and they had everyone sign it with a promise that if they ever broke the rules, they had to buy everyone drinks. And, uh, and so that was their little joke for that conference. But the rules stuck. People have been using them to this day to describe absolute configuration. So you can talk about molecules that aren't you know, related to glyceraldehyde now. You can talk about any molecule just by uh, arranging the priority and using the R and S rules. So as you consider this brief presentation, I encourage you to go through these sort of goals here and make sure that you can do these sort of things when you talk about uh, molecular structure. Can, do you understand the rules of Vesper theory? Can you name molecules using the IUPAC rules? That's something else you're gonna have to review. Do you understand R and S? Um, we won't be using RNS too much in this course. Being biochemists, we'll stick with DNL, but you need to understand that RNS um, are 3D structures just, and, and, uh, and for example, most R centers in sugars are actually D centers. Uh, do you understand the difference between small D and big D? Uh, so small D being the direction it rotates light, big D being it's the same as glyceraldehyde that rotates light to the right in 3D structure. So. Um, review your structure and representation in organic chemistry. Be able to recognize how many carbons are in a structure, how many hydrogens, hydrogens are in a structure, even if I don't show them. How many lone pairs are in a structure, even if I don't show them. Be able to predict what carbons are three-dimensional in structure, like tetrahedral, and which carbons, therefore, might be chiral, if they've got four different things around them. Understand what the dashes and wedges mean, uh, and understand what... Um, uh, R and S for naming them, and D and L for understanding how they relate to D glyceraldehyde. So uh, get busy. You don't have to do all of this today or tomorrow, but as we encounter these topics in biochemistry, you need to look them up in your organic chemistry notes and sort of shore them up in your mind as we encounter them. So always be reviewing throughout this entire course, and we'll see you in class. The aperitif for today is a Montelato. And it's a sherry uh, made in the Montillo region of Spain. Uh, and it's famous for its inclusion in the story by the cask of Amontillado. So I encourage you to read the tasting notes um, as you think about how we have only just begun to explore this topic. And there's more to do. Uh, and so read the textbook, review your organic notes. I can only give you the slightest little aperitif of the knowledge that we need to acquire in biochemistry. And the rest, the feast, is going to be you on your own reading the textbook thinking about the subject, and uh, uh, developing your own understanding of it in your mind. Never be afraid to ask a question. Remember, we're just starting with any one of these lectures. The rest is up to you. I hope you take advantage of an opportunity to explore biochemistry and, or, and the way it relates to organic chemistry. If you're interested in where I got the images from, you can check out my references. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this quick review of uh, chemical structure in organic chemistry, and uh, uh, we'll see you in class.